I'll be reading today um, from the book Luke, chapter 12, verses 32 through 40. Don't be afraid, little flock, because your father delights in giving you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to those in need. Make for yourselves wallets that don't wear out, a treasure in heaven that never runs out. No thief comes near there, and no moth destroys. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be too. Be dressed for service and keep your lamps lit. Be like people waiting for their master to come home from a wedding celebration, who can immediately open the door for him when he arrives and knocks on the door. Happy are those servants whom the master finds waiting up when he arrives. I assure you that when he arrives, he will dress himself to serve, seat them at the table as honored guests, and wait on them. Happy are those whom he finds alert, even if he comes at midnight or just before dawn. But know this, if the homeowner had known what time the thief was coming, he wouldn't have allowed his home to be broken into. You also must be ready, because the human one is coming at a time when you don't expect him. This is God's word for God's people. Thanks be to God. Amen. I think we have some young people today. If you want to go to junior church, you're welcome to. Anyone's welcome. I think Jeremy's going to go. <laughs> no, okay, never mind. He's not going to go. <laughs> Well, how was your week? <clears throat> Fairs are over. Summer's closing on its, on its way down, coming to a close. School's about to start. It's getting interesting, isn't it? How did time go so fast? I hope that you remembered our mission this week, whatever it took you, whatever life brought you to that the mission was still in your mind. I've been studying kind of where we've been and, and where we're going and all of those pieces and parts. And, and looking back at the beginning of the year, we've really gone to some very interesting places as a church. Hopefully, you've taken each week uh, one at a time and you've traveled that road and, and you've made that part of your life. We've talked about the mission. As uh, somebody, uh, uh, Nancy Knight, uh, shrunk it down. How are you doing with your WRPSS? Your worship, your reflection, your prayer, your study, and your service. I thought, man, that's pretty good. I can just type that in there and make it really short. WRPSS, how you doing? The first time she brought that up to me, though, I was like, what does that mean? She's like, Really? You don't know what? I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, I remember. Okay, WRPSS. But then we went on a journey. We went with uh, Jesus to the cross. We followed him as he gave everything for us. We then talked about that early church and what those believers believed in after Jesus had died and rose from the grave. And then last month, we even dug into now that the Holy Spirit is here. How does that Holy Spirit lead us and lead our lives and continue this relationship in the story? Now I have a confession to make. Uh, things Jesus taught, it goes really well with back to school. I did not do that intentionally. I am not that great of a planner. I really am not. I was looking at the lectionary, and I'm looking through these, these passages in the book of Luke, and, and all of these passages in the book of Luke that we're going to do in August, it's Jesus teaching. Jesus is providing the teaching, and I was like, yeah, Jesus taught. That's what all these have in common. He's teaching us. Back to school. <laughs> yeah, and I'm like, man, you're really good at this. I'm just an innocent bystander most of the time. So as we are going to travel this road, uh, for those of you who have little ones, uh, some of you may not be here, bring your backpacks next week uh, back to school because you guys, some of the Jackson Center kids are going to start next week, Riverside kids next week. 
I know. Don't you looked at me like, oh my gosh. But yeah, that's coming real fast. So we're going to bless you and bless uh, the blessing of the backpacks, if you will, however you want to call that. Uh, we'll bless you uh, next week and, and have something special for you. Um, and as we start this journey, I loved where they started. And of all of these passages, you can kind of sum up today's text with Jesus really giving us a stern warning to be ready. Always being ready. Now, if you take the text uh, that, that Brenda gave us, and thank you, Brenda, uh, there's three main points to this text. Number one is right at the beginning, and it's take heart. Don't be afraid, and I changed flock to church. The body of Christ, you right here. Don't be afraid, little church. God is giving you and happy to give you the kingdom. The second point would be to, to not forget the source of your wealth and your happiness. It's not always where we think it is. And third, be ready for Jesus' return. And so in verse 32, Jesus provides us where all good things come from. Don't be afraid, little flock. Don't be afraid. It's okay. This world's going to bring you trials and troubles, but don't be afraid. God is continuing to seek you, look for you, and is willing to give you every good gift that the kingdom of God can provide. Strength, wisdom, guidance, the coming of Jesus to the earth. God wants us to see that heaven and earth are here together today. They're important. Jesus coming to earth, and I've, I've had this discussion with Brenda, I've had it with Dwight, I've had it with a couple other people. Jesus came to earth to take Adam's place, to right the wrong. Mary was selected because she was pure of heart and she was going to take uh, Eve's place and correct the things wrong uh, in, in females as, as well. That way Jesus could then be the one to take Adam's place as the new Adam overlapping then heaven and earth and allowing us to then have the Holy Spirit after he died and rose from the grave so that God is here now all the time and Jesus tells us, don't be afraid. Imagine a God who would give up the life of his son, then to send his Holy Spirit back in his place so that he could be with you all the time. It's pretty awesome. And think about the creator of the universe wants a relationship with me. Went through everything he could think of, including giving up the life of his son to just be in relationship with me. Don't be afraid, little flock. In 33 through 34, Jesus is attempting to let us know that with the kingdom of God being here and now, Jesus in the flesh, we're able to acknowledge that our wealth and happiness are found in the things of God and not in the idols of the world that we create. That's a difficult one, though. Because those things are tangible. They're right here. They're right now. And they, um, in the sense of, of pizza and jelly donuts, they taste really good. Love and relationships here and now are really good. Tangible things are really good, and we get ourselves confused. And yet, the idols that we've made in this world are not intended to take God's place. And when we let those things in the world take God's place, we get trials, we get strife, we get heartache, we get broken. And we forget of where the strength comes from, where the wealth comes from, where true happiness comes from. In verse 33, it's my favorite quote, uh, and in the New Living Translation, I love it that it's worded, the purses of heaven never get old or develop holes. The purses of heaven never get old or develop holes. Your treasure will be safe. No thief can steal it and no moth can destroy it. All right, ladies. 
They, they use the word purse. Men, if you have a purse, that's fine. I, I used to carry one. Um, think back to the first time that you ever had a purse. Can you remember it? Maybe the one you had as a kid. Maybe your favorite one. Do you still have it? Anyone still have it? You still have one? Your original purse. You could. I mean, I'm, but you're the only one that raised your hand. <laughs> there you go. How many times have you used it? A lot? See, you saved it. Very special. So God's purse is kind of like that one. It's very special. But unfortunately, we can use that purse. We can use God's purse, and it's not going to wear out. It's not going to be thrown away. It's not ever going to disappear. Moths can't get it. They can't put holes in it, and no one can make it disappear It will last forever. And the things that you fill it with are so much more important than the things that we fill our purses here in this earth with. I think that battery is, or this this pack is not very good anymore. So... You can fill your life with things, but the one thing that you cannot fill it with too much are things of God. This life will pass away, but Jesus ensures us that the things of heaven are eternal. They will last longer than anything in life. I have often heard that uh, you can see how close you are to God or what your relationship with God looks like by your checkbook. In other words... Where you are spending your earthly money is usually a good determination of where your desires are. Jesus is asking us to fill our lives with the desires of God, the eternal desires that last forever. And this is Jesus' teaching, not my teaching. Uh, I know that I have to put a rein on my spending because if not, my wife's going to get really mad because she's the one that really, she keeps like to keep a tight rein on that. Because if I had it my way, I would just give it all away. And I would keep giving it away and see if God can refill it. And she reminds me that, well, we want to eat this week. And we got to pay to keep the lights on and and the the heat in the winter and the, for me, air conditioning in the summer. You know, we have to keep these things going to survive. And I say, oh, yeah, it's right. And so there comes a limit. In this moment, he's, he's saying that you should sell your possessions. Now, you have to realize in the cultural moment that he's in, possessions were everything. You didn't have a, a savings account at the bank. You didn't have a fancy car. Uh, you typically, if you were lucky, you had land. Uh, if you had uh, more than two animals, you were rich. And so what he's determining is that your possessions do not make who you are. And so if they are a stumbling block for you, sell them and follow me. What's the stumbling block in your life? Is it the savings account that is growing too much and you're hiding it? Is it that you really uh, went into debt further because you had to have that new car? Those are the things that he's asking us to get rid of in order that things would not take his place. And however, giving is not always about money. Tithing is about money. But tithing is also about ourselves, our time, our energy, our gifts, our service to each other. It's all of those things that make up life. It's not just about money. Jesus wraps up today's text with an illustration. It's difficult for us because we don't understand the master-servant relationship as much now in our current culture. But he says, be dressed for service Keep your lamps burning as though you were waiting for your master to return from the wedding feast. Then you will be ready to open the door and let him in the moment that he arrives and knocks. We get the picture. 
So it's hard to put ourselves in that place of a servant standing by the door, lights on, waiting for the master to come home. For us, we probably would have a better idea uh, with the old phrase and, and show of hands, how many of you heard, keep the home fires burning? How many of you heard that before? Yeah, a little bit more than the master-slave thing. Keep the home fires burning was originally uh, a term that came up uh, in the early colonizational type period when you had to leave town to hunt and gather. And so those that were left in town would keep fires lit and ba what lights there were, right, from fire, uh, keep them lit so they could follow their way back home. So imagine us here in this life, we are ready, we are being prepared, but have we stoked the fires of this relationship with God so much so that our home fires are burning, that we are ready for Jesus' return? How many of us can say that our home fires are so bright and so lit and Jesus will not have a hard time finding us when our time comes? The illustration is used to inform us about being ready for his return. We must be active in service, and we must be willing to attend to the processes and the traditions of the church, as John Wesley would want us to. We must keep in our spiritual apron on, ready for his return. It says, he says, he may come in the middle of the night or just before dawn, but whenever he comes, he will reward the servants who are ready. It's very fresh in my mind, and I already warned uh, Deb about it, but it's very fresh in my mind that uh, somebody that I would call a friend um, passed away very quickly. Uh, Rick Hagen uh, used to sit right there just a few weeks ago. Within two weeks, I sat next to him at home, anointed him with oil, prayed over him, and I remember his words to me. And he said, you know, I'm okay. I, I know where I'm going. I know what is going to happen to me, but man, I really wish I just had a few more years. A few more years with my grandkids, a few more years to see them grow up a little bit, and a few more years with my family. And yet Rick was prepared. He was ready. His home fires were bright. I have to say with all of the funerals that I've done in six years, I've never been to a funeral in which every conversation with every person that I talked to, not a single person had any reservation about where Rick was at that moment. Not one. Not one. There was joy. There were some shouts of amen. We mean, we went to church, and we, uh, people in his life uh, got up to speak, and they spoke about Jesus. They spoke about, you know, Rick's going to want you to hear this because you need a relationship with Jesus. And it was more than one. And just the love and the joy and the knowing and we never know, we never know if we've got two weeks, two years, 50 years, we don't know. And so Jesus wants us to make sure that we could be like Rick and that we could be ready. I hope that we're ready for that journey. I hope that we have prepared our hearts that maybe we need to love our neighbors more. Maybe we need to pray a little more. Maybe we need to study more and engage in our relationship with God more. Whatever it is, I hope that we're ready for that. Jesus says in verse 40, you also must be ready all the time for the Son of Man will come when we least expect it. Jesus did not come to lay down his life so that we could have all the material things that we want forever. He did all of that work so that we would not be swayed by the culture of the world, by the enticement of the shiny things, by all of the temporary stuff. Jesus came 
so that we would have an opportunity to engage in our relationship with God, bring light, love, and hope to other people, and be ready. Are we ready? Amen. Before we get to communion, let's pray over our offering. One of the reasons I do that...